Step 2, Fresnel equations 2. In this step, we will uh, derive the remaining two Fresnel equations. So to remind you what we have done in the first step, we have derived the first two Fresnel equations, F1 and F2, for the orthogonal component of the field. Now we will do the same, but considering the parallel uh, component. So now the scenario is the following. Now the E field is parallel to the screen, parallel to the paper, or in other words, it's perpendicular to, uh, there is a perpendicular component to the surface between the two dielectrics, and it's the B field that's pointing out of the screen or in the screen, and that's always parallel with the surface between the two dielectrics. But the logic will be the same as we have uh, seen in the previous step. So we can draw the little triangle again and resolve the horizontal and vertical components of the incident electric field. And they are given by EIH, the horizontal component of the incident electric field is given by EI cos theta i, while the vertical component is given by EI sin theta i. And this is true also for the reflected uh, electric field and the transmitted electric field. And again, we are going to use two boundary conditions given by EH1 is EH2 and BH1 is equal to BH2. In other words, the horizontal components of the E field and B field transport across the boundary. And again, a question remains the same. What is the ratio between the um, parallel component of the reflected uh, electric field with respect to the incident, uh, incident electric field and the same uh, for the transmitted electric field? So this time it's the B field that's always parallel to the surface between the two dielectrics, so we don't have to worry about it. And all we say is that BI plus BR must be equal to BT. And it's the E field that we have to be a little bit more careful about and use only the horizontal components of the electric field. So we get the following, EI times cos theta I, the horizontal component of the incident electric field, minus the horizontal component of the reflected uh, electric field given by ER times cos theta R must be equal to the transmitted horizontal component of the electric field ET times cos theta T. And again, we can re-express the B fields in terms of E fields and then substitute for ET, which will give us Fresnel's third equation given by the following. So for the parallel components of the electric field, we have ER over EI is given by this expression. This looks awfully similar to Fresnel's first equation, but be careful, they are indeed different. In the Fresnel's first equation, we had here N1 times cos theta 1 minus N2 cos theta 2. Similarly, in the denominator, we had N1 times cos theta 1 plus N2 cos theta 2. So be careful, the angles are now swapped around, they're not the same. Similarly, if we um, substitute for the reflected electric field, because we are interested in the ratio of ET to EI, we obtain Fresnel's fourth equation. And again, it looks awfully similar to F2, but be careful, they are different. So here are all four Fresnel equations. And I remind you that the first two equations here in the column on the left are for the orthogonal E-field components, while the uh, column on the right, the ratios are for the parallel electric fields. So our job is done. We have found an expression that relates EI, ER, ET to N1 and 2, the refractive indices in dielectric 1 and uh, dielectric 2, and to the angle of incidence and angle of refraction theta 1 and theta 2. So let's see how we can apply them in real examples. The first example that we're going to consider is very simple. We're going to pick air for our dielectric one and the refractive index of air is simply given by 1. And we're going to pick glass as our dielectric 2 with refractive index 1.5. And to make things easy for our first example, we're going to consider the angle of incidence to be zero. This means that uh, our incident uh, light uh, radiation is coming directly at a uh, 90 degree angle to the surface between the two dielectrics. And this automatically means that the 
uh, reflect, refracted uh, uh, angle theta t is also equal to zero, and the light bounces back with angle theta r, which again is just zero. So we want to know how much of the light gets reflected and how much gets transmitted uh, through the glass. Well, now that we have our Fresnel equations, it's very simple. All we have to do is substitute our values into the expressions that we derived, and we find that the uh, ratio of the reflected electric field with respect to incident electric field is given by minus 0.2. Now, what does this minus mean? All it is saying is that uh, the wave is uh, traveling in the opposite direction. Similarly, for the transmitted electric field, we find that ET over EI is 0.8. But this is not the full story. We don't uh, observe the electric fields. What we observe are the intensities of the electric fields. So we have to find the intensities for the reflected uh, beam and the transmitted beam. For the reflected beam, this is simple because uh, both EI and ER are in the same dielectric in, in the air. So all we do is we take our derived uh, ratio of ER over EI and we square it. And we find that the in intensity uh, uh, IR is given by 0.04. What does this mean? This means that about 4% of the light is reflected from the glass. Now, for the ratio of the transmitted, um, uh, transmitted intensity with respect to the initial intensity, it's a little bit more complicated because we are going from air into glass. So we have to take our ratio of ET over EI, square it, but also we have to multiply by this factor given by right here. Cos theta T, of course, is one, and cos theta I is also equal to one. So in this simple case, it's really just N2 divided by N1 times the square of ET over EI. And that gives us the expected 96% and tells us that if we shine some light at directly at 90 degrees at the glass, 4% will bounce off, while 96% will go through. Now, uh, uh, let's see a second example. This example will be a little bit more complicated, but also it will show us something very, very interesting. And namely, that light reflecting of a dielectric can be polarized. So, let's review our scenario here. Now, theta one is not zero, meaning that the light is not coming directly at the surface, but it's coming at some angle given by theta one. We know that part of it will be reflected and that part of it will be refracted or transmitted into dielectric two. Again, we can resolve the um, electric fields into their parallel and orthogonal components, but for the purposes of this example, we're only going to look at the parallel component. So we know that we have to apply Fresnel's third equation given by the expression here. Now notice that for the parallel polarization or the parallel component of the E field, we have this difference in the, in the fraction. At the, in the top of the fraction. So we can ask the question, is it possible for ER over EI to be equal to zero? In other words, is it possible for the parallel component of the E field to completely vanish? And yes, we can clearly see that that's possible when the following condition is satisfied. When N1 divided by N2 is equal to cos theta one divided by cos theta two. That's interesting. That means that if we have some um, arbitrary polarization of the incident beam and this condition is satisfied, then the reflected beam that's bouncing off the dielectric is not going to have any parallel component. It will only have an orthogonal component. In other words, we are effectively polarizing the light just by simply bouncing it off a surface of another dielectric. So let's work a little bit harder and find out a little bit more about this scenario. We can rewrite this expression by using Snell's law. We have seen Snell's law in our previous module on overview of quantum communication, and it's very simple relation between the angle of incidence and the angle of refraction given the two refractive indices. N1 times sine theta one is equal to N2 times sine theta two. So we have the following expression, N1 over N2, is equal to sine theta two over sine theta one from Snell's law, and 
that must be equal to cos theta 1 divided by cos theta 2, which we obtained using Fresnel's third equation. So let's consider the case, when is this relationship true? We are going to draw a general right-angled triangle. Here we've got our right angle, and these two uh, other remaining angles are labeled theta 1 and theta 2, and we've got sides of uh, x, y, and z. From very simple trigonometry, we know that the following is true, that sine theta 2 over sine theta 1 must be equal to x over y. Why? Because sine theta 2 is given by x divided by z, sine theta 1 is given by y divided by z, so the z's cancel and all we are left with is x over y. Similarly, we are interested in cos theta 1 divided by cos theta 2. And again, cos theta 1 is simply x, x divided by z, and y divided by z gives us cos theta 2. Again, z's cancel and we get the same expression x divided by y. So we see that in this case, uh, we have this, side, this ratio of the sines of the angles equal to this ratio of the cos of the angles. And the necessary condition for that is theta 1 plus theta 2 is equal to 90 degrees, or pi over 2. So we know when, uh, um, when uh, we have the condition when these two ratios are equal, given by this, which is exactly what we were looking for. Also notice, from these expressions we can see that sine theta 1 is equal to cos theta 1, and sine theta 2 is equal to cos theta 1. So we can rewrite Snell's law in the following. All we are doing here, in the original formulation of Snell's law, this expression on the right hand side was n2 times sine theta 2. But we know that sine theta 2 is cos theta 1, so we substitute it in there. And what we get is the following simple expression. We get that the tangent of theta 1, I remind you, theta 1 is the incidence angle, is given by the ratio of the two refractive indices, n2 divided by n1. So what does, the, what does all this trigonometry tell us? It tells us that the reflected, reflected E field is polarized in the orthogonal direction if, if the angle theta 1, the angle of incidence, is given by the arctan of n2 divided by n1. And this angle is, has a special name called Brewster's angle. Now, it might seem like there's a lot of mathematics and trigonometry and manipulations and substitutions. What does it mean in real life? You can go to the beach and you can look at this angle and the light that's coming and reflecting off the water there you will see that there are some patches uh, that are a little bit, little bit less bright. And in particular, if you put on sunglasses and they're polarized in the right direction, those patches will be black. This is exactly the demonstration of, what, of all these mathematics that we have performed here. The light that's coming in is unpolarized, but as it bounces off this, uh, 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 um, the water level, it becomes polarized in a particular direction. And if you're lucky enough and your sunglasses are also uh, uh, polarized in the opposite direction, then you will not see any light. There will be black patches, but only for, for uh, this theta one, only for the Brewster's angle. So it's not like you're going to see everything black. Only at certain angles of incidence, you will see black patches. This concludes our discussion of uh, Fresnel equations and how light interacts with dielectrics. In the next two steps, we will consider how light interacts with metals. See you there.